Dobrodošli u Promjenu okvira, emisiju u kojoj ukazujemo na neke od ključnih društvenih fenomena sadašnjice te na njihove političke i ekonomske dimenzije. U 49. epizodi s filozofkinjom i kvir marksiskinjom Holly Lewis, profesoricom sa sveučilišta u Ostinu te suosnivačicom Međunarodne istraživačke platforme Sexuality and Political Economy Network, razgovarali smo o razlikama između tradicionalnog i opozicijskog seksizma, heteronormativnosti, trans isključivom radikalnom feminizmu, seksualnom radu i antikapitalističkim potencijalima kvirnosti. Intervju je snimljen u sjećnju ove godine u Zagrebu, gdje je Luis održala seminar u okviru Škole neophodnog znanja u organizaciji multimedijalnog instituta MAMA. Kako se razlikuju tradicionalni i opozicijski seksizam? Što nam sistemska analiza mizoginije razotkriva o njezinoj vezi s transmizoginijom? The term traditional sexism and oppositional sexism come from trans author Julia Serrano's work. Traditional sexism is the historic violence against women. Right? This is the denigration of, of women, the violence against women abuse you know comes out of feudalism patriarchy the 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 traditional idea that whoever is a woman is a is a lesser person that is traditional sexism oppositional sexism is the violence that's used to separate the sexes to keep the idea going that there are two opposite sexes. There is a thing called a woman that is a very contained, clear, clearly defined thing. And there is a thing called a man that's a very contained, clearly defined thing. Oppositional sexism is the violence against those who cannot or will not segregate themselves into one category or the, or the other into the category of male or the category of female. This is how Serrano is explaining violence against gay men, violence against men who are perhaps not appearing to be a masculine ideal, violence against women who are not feminine enough, um, but also violence against trans people. These two modes, traditional and oppositional, are mutually reinforcing. Um, and it's important to understand them as mutually reinforcing and what that means is that trans misogyny is something that affects all women including cis women oppositional sexism is also what causes so much brutality and violence between cis men and their need to prove themselves as not women right um and as not as not trans um and as not gay. Kako biste definirali heteronormativnost i u kakvom je ona odnosu s produktivističkom paradigmom? Heteronormativity, how I would define it, is the making of heterosexuality normal. And this is connected to the idea of oppositional sexism. There are men, there are women, and therefore men and women should come together in order to have babies and that is the way that the world um, must and that everyone in the world must operate. It is the pressure on people who are not heterosexual, on people who are not gender binary, to live as binary people in a world where they are attracted to, live with, love, interact with, and behave appropriately with the opposite sex, the so-called opposite sex who is different, who is the other side of, you know, the yin and the yang and all of that good stuff. If we look at it not from our individual atomized perspectives, but if we look at it from the per perspective of capital, the reason why capital wants us to do this is so that we can produce the next generation of workers. Neoliberal and also in the US, the neoconservative modes are very concerned with the family. They're very concerned with the stability of the family. They're very concerned with uh, the passivity of the family. They're very concerned with the efficiency of the family training children to behave in a particular manner so that they can operate as workers that are docile, productive, produce surplus value, work quickly, um, and are obedient. It's not just simply ideas in our heads. It's about 
how we're shaped navigating this terrain. And part of that terrain is the family, and part of that terrain is the family structure, which is organized differently depending on what the historical needs of capital were. I definitely don't want to speak about it in a way that's reductive. Um, because we aren't simply what we are told that we're supposed to be. We're not simply what we're socialized into. If that were the case, then there wouldn't be trans people who existed at all. So clearly that's not what's happening. But we are socialized to be, there are pressures on us to behave in particular gendered ways. They are, uh, they're contingent upon class. Women in, in working class women are raised to be different kinds of women than ruling class women are. Um, working class women are raised to take care of people. Ruling class women are not necessarily raised to take care of people because nannies are going to take care of their children. Um, so there's a, a different meaning how, how people are socialized is different. You don't see a whole lot of capitalist daycare centers, for-profit daycare centers um, that are all run by men. You don't, right? Um, you don't see a lot of uh, uh, construction teams that are all women and all feminine people. When we sell our, our, our labor on the market, we're selling gendered labor on the market, right? And this gets interpreted by us to reinforce the idea that, well, men are one thing and women are another. Women like doing this type of work and men like doing that kind of work. No, women are trained to do a particular type of work. Men are trained. Women are hired to do particular types of work and men are hired to do particular types of work. Women are harassed when they try to do other types of work. Um, the other thing as well is that we have to look at how when, when different jobs are feminized, they the wages become lower on them. The denigration of women denigrates everybody's pay, ultimately. The feminization den denigrates everybody's pay. Um, so when we enforce oppositional sexism, when we abide by oppositional sexism, when we naturalize it and when we think that it is, say, a part of the workers' movement or something along those lines, then what we're doing is we're really cutting our own throats. In the United States, racism works in, in, in similar ways. Um, the idea is that the oppression, the denigration of people, the, um, the marginalization, the idea that peoples are inferior, that certain people are inferior, means that you can pay them less, that they are worth less on the market. This obviously, reduces the, the, the pay for everybody in the entire sector. So when somebody in the working class is being racist, they are also cutting their own throat. I mean, on an individual level, they may be getting their individual self promoted, but ultimately what they're doing is they're undermining the working class's power. This is why this is not just simply identity politics, because this is something that affects everyone, everybody who has to sell their labor, or everybody who's dependent on somebody who has to sell their labor. Cis žena i transrodne osobe najzgled su logične saveznice i saveznici u osporavanju kapitalističkih rodnih režima. Međutim, određene struje radikalnog feminizma pokazuju otvoreni antagonizam prema trans zajednici. Radi li se samo o konceptualnom razilaženju i ako je tako, može li se problem adresirati isključivo na toj razini? I think that this kind of idea that one group's struggle for survival under capital is taking attention away from the other group's survival under capital. It's a very strange notion and undercuts the basic principles of solidarity that, you know, we as, as leftists, as Marxists should, should strive for. I don't think that it's merely a conceptual issue. And the reason why I say this is because of the intensity of the reaction to trans people amongst those that we call in the US TERFs, trans exclusionary radical feminists. The levels of violence against trans women, a lot of this is often done in secret, sending images of dead trans women to women online. 
um, uh, just all kinds of threats, uh, personal attacks. There's a sense of a reaction that's happening. And by reaction, I do mean reactive, and I do mean that there's a reactionary element to it. Um, but there is also an aspect of this that is that does come down to some concepts. And that is the idea that there is something called gender, is something called sex. This is where Judith Butler makes a lot of sense and really can't be thrown out um, and dismissed. And that is that the idea of gender is constructed to make sex look like something that's, that's real and unconstructed. The whole point of that is to essentialize the body as this concrete thing that cannot be changed, as this natural thing that uh, is beyond any kind of culture. That, And I think that this is where the fear comes from. It's a touchstone. In this world where everything is shifting all the time, there's this idea that I can rely on this natural body, this natural uh, form that exists in some kind of platonic heaven of forms, that there's this body called the woman's body and it looks like this. One of the things that I don't understand is how after women through second wave feminism, I mean the mantra was, we are not reducible to our bodies. And now all of a sudden, when trans women say we're women, it's, oh, we're reducible to our bodies, right? <laughs> so this is an incredibly conservative position. And we see, actually, alliances that have formed between trans-exclusionary radical feminists and conservatives and the far right. We need to be able to point out the materiality of the bodily complexity, the social complexity that we all live under. We are material creatures that live in a material world that's built on material social relations. So our genders are material and our genders are not reducible to the, you know, certain body parts. I've heard many trans activists say that recently that all gender is a kind of a wound that we're all trying to struggle through. It's all an imposition on all of us. We're all trying to struggle through it. And I think that there's a real possibility for solidarity in that. Uh, a, 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 Universal solidarity. U uvodu svoje knjige The Politics of Everybody tvrdite da se termin svi različito upotrebljava u fašističkim, neoliberalnim te socijalističkim odnosno marksističkim imaginarijima i diskursima. Možete li to pojasniti? I'm talking about everybody uh, hopefully not in a way that is idealist or even idealistic, but is very concretely real. We are exchanging products that are made by people all around the world that may have, that do have different backgrounds, that have different relations to the family, that have different relations to history, that, and we need to work that out if we're going to end capital. There's differences in what we can offer the movement. So those differences shouldn't be erased, but they are part of a whole because we do live in, in one, one world and we live in one world under one financial system right now. For a socialist, um, for a Marxist, the idea of everybody means that we need to be inclusive of everybody uh, in terms of in, in terms of, of class struggle. Uh, we need to be clear about uh, who our enemies are, which is something I don't really write about in the book, which I'm going to be writing about in future books. Um, and uh, who are our comrades? Once somebody is, we've decided on that, that, that this person is in the struggle with us, that these, this group is in the struggle with us, and then we're comrades, we, we, they are included in the everybody that, you know, we're fighting for a new world together. Fascists are incredibly frightened by the term everybody. Um, the idea is that, you know, in order to preserve uh, ways of life that I mean, are really fictitious and metaphysical because ways of life are always changing. This idea that there's some static culture that has always been in a place. Um, but their idea is that uh, everything should be taxon taxonomized, everything should be structured, and everything should be segregated in order to preserve differences is what they say. But these differences are already 
codified uh, and pre-decided beforehand outside of experience. This is a, a kind of a, a, a violent, annihilative uh, idea of the word everybody, where the idea of everybody becomes a, a geopolitical problem where people have to be pushed into certain territories that they belong in, blood and soil rhetoric, so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, fascists aren't just those who want to see the world be one race or one nation. I mean, you know, because they usually want others to serve them, right? So they, they want a world that's, that's segregated. The neoliberal way of everybody is, is atomized, is everyone atomized operating in the market, meeting at the points of exchange in the market, as they famously say. Um, that's our point of unity when we interact with one another at the points of exchange in the market. Of course, this erases all of the, the connections that are actually in the products that we're exchanging, in the commodities that we're exchanging, the labor that has gone into producing these uh, uh, commodities that we're exchanging. The family is the basis of this mode of individualism. So I'm beginning to not really call it individualism, but familyism, because at its core, what it, what it relies upon is the uh, domestic labor that produces labor and that cares for labor when it's too old to work anymore. Radikalna feministkinja dovode u pitanje činjenicu da je seksualni rad rad, često ga izjednačavajući s trgovinom ljudima. Zašto bismo se trebale boriti za priznavanje seksualnog rada kao rada? This idea of sex work as not work is very strange. Why would any other kind of work not be considered work? Do we say that teaching isn't work because it's educational, it's, it's, it's emotional, or maybe it's enjoyable for some people. No, we have teacher strikes. We understand that teachers work for a wage. Like any other form of work, nobody is selling their body. They're selling their labor. They're not selling their body, or those of us who are sex workers. It's selling labor, not selling a body. Um, you're not exchanging your body as a commodity, it's, you're just simply not. Sex workers are workers. People who are being trafficked are not workers. They are kidnapped people who are enslaved. There are also, in the United States, kidnapped workers who work in restaurants. We don't run around telling restaurant workers when they're organizing, well, what about the people who are kidnapped to work in the back of restaurants? If you're being trafficked, you're a victim. I mean, it's like this idea, this term in the US was child prostitutes for a long time. And we've all pushed back. There's no such thing as a child prostitute. There's somebody, a child who's been kidnapped, who's being sexually assaulted. That's not, that's not a sex worker. It's often the people who are sex workers who are the first to be able to say this person is not a sex worker. They have been kidnapped and they need help. In the United States, what the people who have fought back against sex workers, confusing them, conflating them with trafficking victims, what has happened is they've undermined the ability to find people who are being trafficked because it was sex workers who were helping. What we have now is a situation where it's illegal to sell sex services online or uh, 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 on the back of, an, in, you know, there was this big thing on the back page where people were offering their services. So it's also, if there's any connection to sex work at all, then it could be considered sex trafficking, so no web servers will take these sites and so on and so forth. So what has this done? It's pushed sex workers out into the street where they will never see trafficked people, where they will never be able to report on that. The reason why I would completely oppose this idea that sex work is some kind of special work where it violates your very soul is that these ideas are, first of all, work violates all of our souls. If you like doing something, like if, if you're forced to do something over and over again, it's often soul crushing to you either way. But there's the sentimentality around sexuality that what it's really saying is good women are women that see sex as connected to their soul. 
Why are you the sex worker? Why, does, why doesn't this matter to you? Why aren't you harmed by this? This is right wing material. This isn't, I don't even understand what the place is of this on the left. It just seems to be to be a reinstantiation of family values that, you know, women are gentle creatures that need protection in the home. This appeal to nature, this appeal to purity that women sometimes fall back on, particularly white women, particularly middle class women. This particular appeal is a desperate attempt to say, I am a mother of nations. I am a part of a family. I am a daughter. That's where I get my worth from. Um, see me as a sacred being. But what you shouldn't see me as is raw material not how you treat black women, not how you treat working women, not how you treat their bodies. There's this idea that the, the labor of women of color, the labor of women in the global south, all of that labor is treated as if it's raw material. So I think that there's this check against that. We don't need to say, oh, how do I help this person? Let me dream this up in my mind. We need to listen to people who have survived trafficking and listen to what they're saying. And we need to listen to sex workers and we need to listen to sex workers who were formerly trafficked. And we need to listen to what people are saying and not have these ideas of how to rescue people. We need to empower people to, you know, to rescue themselves, to stand up and to fight. All power to sex workers. <laughs> who, to determine their fate and future as workers and to fight and stand as workers and we need to fight and stand with them. U koje mjeri kvirnost i kvir politike podrivaju tradicionalnu heteronormativnu obitelj kao ključnu instituciju za reprodukciju kapitalističkog sistema proizvodnje? I do not think that queer people alone or that simply queer people being queer is going to stop capitalism. Um I do not think that we can challenge the family in the way that we have our interpersonal relationships. I don't think that by our behaviors within our families or by contesting the family, by living outside of it or creating experimental communities under capitalism is going to change it. I think it's going to be co-opted or I think it's going to have you know, these things can be very emotionally edifying for individuals, but that's not going to solve cap, that's not going to end capitalism. The family exists under capital because capital requires it and capital pressures us to behave in these manners. And there's also benefits for it, right? I mean, we, there, there are legal benefits, there's legal protections, there's social benefits. So you're not going to change what capital needs by just simply being yourself. Capital doesn't always need or want a family. At base, it generally needs family. Maybe you could say family in the last, insta in, in the last instance. Capitalism needs family in the final instance. <laughs> Babies aren't produced capitalistically, right? They're not produced as commodities and traded. They're not, they're not subsumed into the economy. They're not, they're not produced in that sense, so yeah. And until then, we're going to have to have families. We're going to have, have, but once people get to the age where they're in a workforce, that's when the family may just not be necessary anymore. There is dormitory labor all over the world. If we think about workers who leave their, say, peasant communities and go to live in, in sex segregated dormitories where they reproduce themselves, in a dormitory style life or the way that how in South Africa minors were separated from their families in order to undermine black connection and solidarity, right? Uh, black people's connection to their roots historically. We only need your family for to get you to the age where you can work and then we need the family to come back in when you're too old to work because somebody needs to take care of you for free so that we can make more money so that, you know, to increase our surplus value. So we don't need to pay for your life. So that we don't need to pay for services for you. We need to take care of one another as, as workers. And we, we need to have people who are in families that they're happy with, that they're in heteronormative families, and they're okay with that. And that's what works for them. 
we need to understand that they need to be in solidarity with queer people because we're all part of the same movement and they need to stand up for queer people and they need to stand up for trans people. But at the same time, this idea of queer separation this idea that queerness in itself is just so radical that it's going to change the world is also faulty. We have to look at what are the struggles on the ground that we need to be in solidarity with, even if the people that we're solidar solidarizing with are not necessarily queer themselves. And so this doesn't mean, of course, that we support like gay bashing dictators or something along those lines. What I mean is when I meet comrades who are from the Congo, who've been displaced, who are homeless. The first question that I ask them isn't necessarily about like their queerness or social reproduction or right. The first thing is that they are my comrades and I need to I need to find out how I can help. It's this interpersonal exchange through us organizing to end capitalism on an international scale that makes the difference. That's how we end the family. That's how we end heteronormativity. That's how we end the regime of the family, I should say, because saying and ending the family becomes very contentious, as if queer people want to go around tearing apart people's families, which is completely not the case. I mean, you know, we fight for keeping families together at the border. We fight for keeping families in their homes when landlords throw them out. So we don't want to tear apart people at the individual level. Um, but the idea is that we have to combat this enforced familialism. We have to combat this, this forced heteronormativity.